Hello and welcome to Failure to Stop on YouTube. This is the number one channel where police meet society and culture. I'm your host, Drew Breezy. I'm excited to bring to you a crossover episode today. I was interviewed by Abby Ellsworth, who is a fellow podcaster. She runs a podcast called On Being a Police Officer. I strongly suggest you check this podcast out, download the episodes, listen to what she has to say. Abby is a civilian interviewing law enforcement. She asks the questions that the media should be asking, and her perspective is so important. So what we're going to do for this breakdown is we're going to discuss an article that she found from the front page of the Sunday New York Times from October 11th, 2021, over a year ago. And the print version of the article's uh, headlines was how broken taillights end in killings by police, which would lead you to believe that if you have a broken taillight, you're going to be murdered by police officers. So here's this episode. Please listen to and download Abby's podcast. Please listen to and download Failure to Stop on all podcast platforms. I'm going to let the conversation speak for itself. Take it away. Hi, I'm Abby Ellsworth. I'm a civilian interviewing law enforcement from around the country. My goal is to tell the real stories of law enforcement, the ones that don't make the news. Today, however, I am talking about an article that did make the news, and this was the New York Times just a little over a year ago. And I have invited my friend and returning guest, Drew Breezy, to join me in walking through this article. Many of you already know Drew is a retired lieutenant from the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. He retired just over a year ago after 19 years in law enforcement. He has since then launched Drew Breezy Uncuffed, in which he gets to talk about whatever he wants as it comes to law enforcement. And it is across various social media platforms. Drew, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Abby. I don't mean to big shot you, but it was uh, 28 years and 11 months of, of life. <laughs> well, it's interesting how many officers. I, t I just recently interviewed a SWAT officer who was just shy of whatever many years, and he just was like, I'm done. Yeah. Just done. I think that's kind of <laughs> common in the industry right now. Um, I, I tell the same story. Like, if you'll notice, that was 28 years and 11 months. It wasn't 29 years, or it wasn't a nice, even tight 30 years. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I came yeah. to the conclusion that a number is just a number, and it's not worth your, your mental yeah. health. And when it's time to go, it's time to go. Yeah. I'm glad you served. I appreciate that. But what I really, and I've said this to you many times, I value your opinion, and I'm always impressed how you're able to break down an issue or an incident in an informed but also fair and balanced manner, which is something I've searched high and low for. And so I – go ahead. I, I appreciate you saying that because uh, the crux of being an officer is uh, looking at things objectively. We're the, the world's referees. So, um, you know, when I'm out there calling balls and strikes, uh, it, it, does, it may not seem like um, law enforcement is a profession that is – loaded for um, objectivity, but you'll find since we have to testify to 99% of what we do in some way, shape or form, um, we're, we're just, we're protecting both the victim and the potential suspect in, the, in whatever case we're investigating. Right. Well, so this article, I, I'm, I've sent it to you and I've talked about it with you this article appeared over a year ago, and I have literally hung on to it since then. I have it here. Um, what I noticed in preparing for our interview today is that the, the link that I sent you, the title is Why Many Police Traffic Stops Turn Deadly. But the original, which I have here, says How Broken Taillights End in Killings by Police. <laughs> How Broken Taillights. And this is for my audience can't see this. It's above the Sunday New York Times above the fold, front cover above the fold, and then the sub story headline: At traffic stops, officers' presumption of danger breeds overreaction and seemingly avoidable deaths. So this is, this is the premise of the article, and so. They've clearly decided what they're going to talk about. 
and everything that they, they, it's kind of like a debate. And so you choose information that is going to support your, your premise. Right. Right. And so they make a premise and then everything they say supports that. And then they make a statement which is really opinion, but then they refer back, refer back to it as fact. Right. So I thought I would just, what I would do is, I'm sorry for this papers here, but I read papers. Um, <laughs> I am going to read a section and throw it to you to comment. Okay. And so I'm going to start at the beginning and they start with quotes from officers. So this is me interpreting an officer. Open the door now. You are going to get shot. An officer in Rockfields, Illinois, shouted at Nathaniel Edwards after a car chase. Hands out the window now or you will be shot, yelled a patrolman in Bakersfield, California, as Marvin Urbina wrestled with inflated airbags after a pursuit. I am going to shoot you. What part of that don't you understand? Threatened an officer in Little Rock, Arkansas as she tried to pry James Hartsfield from his car. I've specifically left, I was going to summarize this, but I've left the names of the suspects in for a reason that I will come back to. It goes on to say, the officers who issued those warnings had stopped the motorists for common offenses, swerving across double yellow lines, speeding recklessly, carrying an open beer bottle. None of the men were armed. Now, technically, that is grammatically incorrect, so I'm just going to call the New York Times on that. None of the men was armed. Yet within moments of pulling them over, officers fatally shot all three. None of the men was armed. Yet within moments of pulling them over, officers fatally shot all three. The deaths are among a series of seemingly avoidable killings across the United States. Over the past five years, a New York Times, a New York Times investigation found, so their own investigation, police officers have killed more than 400 drivers or passengers who were not wielding a gun or a knife or under pursuit for a violent crime, a rate of more than one a week. So let's just unpack a few things. <laughs> um, and I'll let, here's what I, here's what sticks out to me. Common offenses to describe legitimately concerning and dangerous driving. Right. None was armed, yet shot by police. Leaves out every level of detail and situational danger. Right. The words seemingly avoidable killings is an opinion. Right. They draw an illogical conclusion. How about this? Uh, I, I mean, common offenses... <laughs> There are about 20 million traffic stops con uh, conducted every year. So um, an offense is an offense. I don't know how common or, or uncommon it is. I mean, there's a lot of drunk drivers on the street. So is that a, is that a common offense? Or, you know, uh, uh, are we only supposed to, and when I say we, I mean law enforcement, are we only supposed to stop people for uncommon offenses? I mean, it, it, the the... I think in the concept of priming, um, you know, Gladwell talks about priming Malcolm Gladwell, the book, you know, where he describes, you know, he, he can lay out a series of thoughts and your brain is automatically going to thin slice and go right where you think it needs to go. And this is front loaded with police violence. And, and those are terms like, I keep seeing like the center for police violence where they track <laughs> shootings of law, uh, where they track shootings involving law enforcement officers, officer involved shootings. So it's termed police violence. It's never termed violence against the police. And often that's how those encounters either start or turn or end. So Right up front, I mean, there is a problem with the phraseology, and I also see issue with cherry picking three traffic stops out of twenty million. I, listen, I don't have my head buried in the sand that I think that stuff like this doesn't go on, that um, that there are officers that are working on, uh, say, a level seven 
out of 10 alertness when, when in actuality they might not need to be on a level seven out of 10. But this is written by people who have never conducted a traffic stop. I, I kind of take issue with, um, you know, when, when, when we're called out for, um, affecting traffic stops for common offenses, well, what else am I, what else, know, <laughs> what else well, are we supposed to do? <laughs> and it's like they're diminishing. The, the word common diminishes swerving across double yellow lines, speeding recklessly. I'm sorry. If somebody's doing that in front of me, I would like them to be pulled over. Yeah. You know, that's, so. <laughs> that's neither common. No, no, yeah, I mean, like, you're 100% right. There, there's a, I, I think that there is a, a misconception also that this is done to target criminals or target criminal activity or just look for uh, look to generate revenue for the municipality or, or something to that effect. What is always left out of the conversation is the fact that this is a very small percentage of people that's be that are being stopped. And there's a very high percentage of people that are being protected because of these stops. Not every single one results in an act of violence. Not every right. one result ends in, in, in a car chase or, and, and, and quite frankly, not every single one ends up in a citation or some kind of right. punitive uh, disposition. I mean, and, and, you know, we do get stuff wrong at times, but if, if there is no traffic enforcement, there's no safety for the rest of the citizens. There's no pedestrian safety and, uh, you know, in, in communities that don't have sidewalks, there's no, there's just no safety in general if we don't make traffic stops, enforce traffic laws and, um, you know, do the corrections that need to be done. Well, and then the, the next, then they go on to say yeah, of this 400, and I guess it was over a five year period. I'm looking here that okay. most of the officers. So have killed more than 400, uh, drivers or passengers. Most of the officers did so with impunity. So, uh, I Go ahead. <laughs> I, I can honestly say uh, th there aren't. I, I can't say there are none. I, I could say there are point zero zero something percent uh, that may go into work thinking that they're going to shoot and kill somebody, or looking forward to the moment that they get to use their gun, or um, like a very very high percentage, almost all. Are, are not wired that way. In fact, we want to avoid that. And to even double down on that, to kind of say, look, this is 2022. You, you don't want to use force. You're going to be scrutinized from nine ways until Sunday. Um, so thinking that somebody goes in with reckless abandon or, or um, I forget the term they use. Uh, in you know, with impu so, so thinking that we go in with impunity, just like, okay, well, here's an opportunity to stop a car, which is an opportunity to pull my gun out, which is an opportunity to shoot somebody, which is kind of what that implies. Not kind of, that is exactly what that implies. Um, no, the, the, it, there is no impunity when it comes to traffic stops. We're bound, you know, pe people want police accountability, but they often forget that there is a constitution of the United States. There's um, uh, Supreme Court rulings, there are uh, statutes in every state, there are municipal codes in every city, there are uh, uh, operating procedures in every department. There's plenty of accountability. And um, mm -hmm. it's just overlooked when something like this happens. And it's completely oversimplified when something like this happens. It's, it's kind of it's kind of like saying, um, you know, well, it, he, all he he died because he had an open beer bottle. No, mm -hmm. that, 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 there's a lot that happened between A right. and C. Right. And, yeah, and yeah, impunity implies they got away with something. You That's know. That's true. So, so then they say, and and I am skipping ahead. The recurrence of such cases and the rarity of convictions both follow from an overstatement ingrained in court precedents and police culture of the danger that vehicle stops pose to officers, claiming a sense of mortal peril, whether genuine in the moment or only asserted later. Um, it, it's, it, it's 
skipping the check and balance of the legal system. And I, I can't offer an apology for the Supreme Court saying, yes, we, we are going to have to use the officer's frame of mind given the circumstances the officer was in. We cannot use hindsight as the standard. There's no apology for that. You, you, you Like, that's what the court says. And until the court changes that, that's what that's what we're we're going to have to live with. That's part of the check in the balance. Well, and what they're setting up here is this idea that officers create the jeopardy. So dozens of encounters appear to turn on what criminologists describe as officer created jeopardy. Officers regularly and unnecessarily place themselves in danger by standing in front of fleeing vehicles or reaching inside car windows, then fired their weapons in what they later said was self-defense. Frequently, officers also appear to exaggerate the threat. Um, more than three quarters of the unarmed motorists were killed while attempting to flee. I have an idea. Don't flee. <laughs> I, so, I think you're one of the more brilliant criminologists. <laughs> criminologists of our time. Um, well, yeah, I, I, I think. Uh, listen, there there is a tug of war in uh, within the profession, within um, law enforcement, over officer created exigencies. Like, we can't obviously, as administrators or, or agencies, you can't train officers to put themselves in an exigent circumstance. You also cannot control when the officer is in the exigent circumstance and every single one of them is unique on its own. I mean, I've taken flack on social media um, for calling out a certain pursuit and shoot in the ensuing shooting. It was like a low level, or I mean, I'm sorry, a low speed um, pursuit because the officers just kept their lights and sirens on behind the, the vehicle. The vehicle pulled into a cul-de-sac and they, fought, they they followed the vehicle into the cul-de-sac, giving no room for exit, um, which, I mean, tactic, tactically, that's a flip of a coin, whether that's acceptable or not. And then um, the officer gets out of the car with the gun drawn and now is faced with this, sh an actual shoot-don't-shoot shoot scenario because the vehicle is either coming at him or trying to flee. Well, the officer didn't need to get out of the vehicle at that point, or the officer didn't need to chase him into a cul-de-sac or, you know, th there is a fine line when you're a line officer of like, man, at what point do we still get to arrest criminals who are doing injustices to the, to the community or to the, to the pa uh, taxpayers that deserve to be protected and have to think and rethink and, and, and do all these, you know, second guessings, before we actually take a law enforcement action. But there are also things that we need to change in the profession or retrain or evaluate. And that's one of them. We have to make sure that we're not creating the exigency just as the article states. But I, I would argue like when you're, when you're struggling with somebody who's reaching for something like a hammer in the back seat or a gun, or you don't know what they're reaching for, and you're trying to hold their shoulders in place, or you're trying to grab the keys out of the ignition and, and hold their arm, and they take off down the road, they put it in drive. I, I mean, did you really create that exigency? You, you you did what you had to do to kind of go on the offensive to to defend yourself, if that even makes sense. And you ended up in a situation where now they're driving down the road, which to you probably seem, you know, I mean, have you ever seen a, a, a bug on your windshield? Like I, I'm sure at 10 miles an hour, the bug kind of flies off. I mean, like that's how you feel when you're being drugged by a vehicle and you don't know, you know I've had coworkers that were run over by the back wheels. And um, there are just a lot of variables that can happen when you're being drugged by a, a you know, 2000 pound vehicle with someone who is obviously trying to get away from a uniformed law enforcement officer, which is always something that's overlooked. Also, just as you said a minute ago, and you're in the, in the brilliant criminological statement, <laughs> you can always choose not to flee. Yes. And it, it, I just think it's unfair to paint officers as purposefully creating 
um, danger as a, an excuse to go hands on or use force. Yeah. It's, it's, it's foolish to do so. I, I mean, it, it, first of all, in the era of, uh, of body cams, and, and I could tell you just before there were body cams, there were still ATM cameras and there were, uh, you know, mint mobile cameras. You know what I mean? There, there were just cameras everywhere. So um, officers are trained more that there is a camera watching you. And this was before body worn cameras. There is a camera watching you. Officers are trained that all the time. So to create an exigency just to be right. able to use force, I, I would say it's probably a little bit lower percentage than what's being purported here. And again, I, I would never say that it doesn't happen. I'm sure it happens. But okay. I, I would think that the incidence is pretty low and the discovery of how it happened would be pretty high. Okay. Well, then uh, here's what, a line that I like sort of within, well, I don't like, it's sort of within this theme there's a, a deputy they uh, refer to Deputy Boyle, though he had 70 pounds on the driver, told investigators he feared he might be stuck half inside a moving car. I was convinced this is how I'm going to die. So he shot Mr. Donald. I love this, though he had 70 pounds on the driver. He didn't. They weren't this. They weren't in a squared circle. They they weren't in a boxing ring at the time, and, and nobody measured their reach. And uh, he actually may have had seventy pounds on him, but he didn't have the twenty or two thousand pounds of a vehicle. Uh, so <laughs> I, he's, he's down by nineteen thirty, by my estimation. So, right. um, you, you know, I, again, the word the word play and and what right um w what's being uh, perpetuated or what's being um, just, just in general uh, being painted the picture that's being painted that, you know, this is like lawless thugs coming out here that, um, Hey, let's just turn the lights on and pull our guns out and then reach in the car. And, and we'll just say that it, it just doesn't happen that way. No, nobody wants to be hurt on their, on the job. Nobody wants to hurt anybody else. I mean, uh, again, I'm not going to say that definitively, but, just about nobody wants to hurt anybody else. So uh, I, I do agree with you. It's a fair, it's a mischaracterization that they are creating ex exigencies just to use force. It may be fair to say right. that they are not thinking clearly in a, uh, in, uh, in a traumatic moment. Um, and they are putting themselves in some unnecessary jeopardy that, uh, for some reason in their brain, in their lizard brain, the, the, the need to apprehend somebody outweighs their own safety. That happens a lot. That happens more often than not, but I, I don't think it's an intentional act. No, I don't think so either. I just, the, the idea that they would refer to his weight as an advantage in a, it just, it just points to their lack of understanding and right. it diminishes their credibility, frankly, in my opinion. I agree. And this is where they kind of try to be balanced. Traffic stops are by far the most common police encounters with civilians and officers have reason to be wary in their approach. They don't know who is inside a car or whether there are weapons. 10 officers have been killed this year in such interactions. And this is October, 2021, including a Chicago officer who was shot in August by a passenger during a traffic stop for an expired registration. A Chicago officer, not Ella French, right. a, Chica a Chicago officer. So in the beginning, they're very clear to use the names of the suspect who was killed. It, it doesn't but when it gets a white female Chicago officer either. And it, you know, let's try to make sure the officer has no identity. Right. Um, you know, importantly, um, Carlos Yanez, uh, were it not for a couple centimeters would be a second Chicago officer was killed in the same traffic stop. Right. And then the, the third officer, uh, also took fire. Uh, but the, the suspect luckily had, and I'm not even making a joke, but luckily he had bad aim. So, I mean, that's three. So I, I just, 
it, it never ceases to amaze me that we're talking about an article where police create danger or police with reckless abandon shoot people. Yet here's a prime example. Exactly. Of one uh, traffic stop where three officers could have been killed. One was killed and two luckily evaded death. One, one barely, you know, he spent time in the ICU. So I don't think I'm over dramatic right. what happened, but, but again, so, you're a hundred percent right. Like stripped of identity and, and, and everything else. He's 29 years old, 29 years old. And so Carlos Yanez, her partner who was severely injured, I, I follow him on Facebook he has a, and I think everyone should follow. He has a Carlos Strong Facebook page. You know, they don't. There's no consideration given to the rest of his life. I mean, we've lost her. Her family's lost her. The department's lost her. This man, his life is forever changed. Right. Uh, and I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I mean, where's the, where's that story? Well. So, and, and how many other Carloses are there? I mean, it's easy to report that there were 40 law enforcement deaths and only three were traffic stops, which I would take issue with anyway. But, um, I, well, how many near deaths or how many bad shots or how many, uh, yeah, I had my cell phone in the same pocket where the bullet hit. So it, it slowed the path of the bullet down and, you know, how many of those, but they're not reported on. You know what else isn't reported on is the remainder of the 20 million traffic stops that go just perfectly well. Yep. Well, in, in his father, um, Carlos Yanez Sr., was quoted in the Chicago Times as blaming, I think it was new police reform or something the mayor had done, um, potentially making officers hesitant to pull their weapon to fire. It really does get back to what I was saying um, at the beginning of this. Like there is a hesitancy. There is where, where it used to be uh, early on in my policing career was all of a sudden liability became a hot button issue. And now we're all worried about getting sued and we're all worried about until, you know, even the attorneys where I worked came out and said, you do your thing. We'll do our thing. Don't worry about the lawsuit. Just worry about getting home or, you know, they didn't to put it that way, but they're, they're just essentially saying, we'll, we'll handle the X's and O's. Just get out there and instinctively act, you know, to, to save your life. So um, the new round of hesitancy is, um, is this interaction like it, because it's, it's definitely used against us when you, when you're in a crowd of more than two people or three people, don't think that there aren't two cell phones out <laughs> filming your interaction. And there's all kinds of, Oh, I can't believe they're doing that. And um, it, it's just the, the way things go and we roll with the punches and we evolve with it. And um, some take it better than others, especially in, in, in high stress situations. But, it has created it. I mean, I don't know how to quantify it or, or, or I don't even know how to, you know, I don't know what method you would use to, to gather that data, but an officer is definitely going to think twice about pulling their gun out to which some social justice advocates or social justice warriors in some cases, whatever you want to say would say, good, that was yeah. our goal. The problem is articles just like this are what, is perpetuating that. And it's not the total picture. It's, it's a minimal picture and it's over exaggerated to begin with. Yeah, exactly. That's the danger. I mean, I, that is the danger of an article like this. You, you have a dry, you have so many unknowns. You have just way too many confounding variables. It's not, it's never just one cop pulls over one car with one driver and the driver's compliant, and it doesn't work that way. There, there could be six people in the car. There could be two people in the car. There could be a driver in the car who is compliant, but a mouthy civilian in the back who is getting in the way of the interaction between the driver and the police officer, and the police officer just wants to go about their business, but they're antagonizing and, and 
it's on somehow on that officer to de-escalate the situation when they're being escalated for right. no reason whatsoever. I mean, it's they're being escalated because they they're doing their job by pulling the driver over. So um, it, it's 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 frustrating. So just with that many variables in the car, are the windows tinted? Is there a gun under the seat? Is there a gun in the glove box? Are they going to tell you they have a gun? Is there, have they never seen a weapon or handled a weapon in their entire life? I mean, you don't know any of these things. Right. I think even somewhere in here, and I'm, I don't know if I've um, gotten to it, but they reference things that people were actually reaching for. Like one was a blowtorch, you know, one's a hammer, but it's, you know, because it's not a gun, it's not a weapon. It's like, yeah, no, those are weapons. Yeah. It's, um, <laughs> It's the, the term unarmed. I mean, they even yeah, yeah, yeah. Make reference to Michael Brown being an unarmed black man, but his DNA was found on Officer Darren Wilson's gun. There was obviously a struggle at some point for Darren Wilson's gun, or somehow his DNA got on that gun. So, yes, I guess by um, like definition, at the time he was shot, he was unarmed. That doesn't mean that Darren Wilson wasn't beaten to within an inch, an inch of his life. Um, and that side of the story is never told. Well, again, you know, I think part of the the overall challenge is what I'm trying to get at with this article. And when those are the only incidents that make the news, there is no perspective. So of the millions of contacts that go well, Right. These are the only ones that you see. Very often, these incidents are not viewed through a lens, a law enforcement lens. It's, you know, if as you have said, if law enforcement has done something wrong, then then they should be held accountable. But I guess, you know, one of the challenges, what I get frustrated with, as do you and most law enforcement is that no one ever asks why and then waits for the answer. Right. No one ever asks why wanting to know what happened. They asked, why didn't you do it this way? Why right. I'm asking you why, because I'm judging you. I don't really want to know why I want to judge you. That's well, the well, challenge. They assert facts that don't, that just aren't true. Like, that there is a plague of white right. officers killing black citizens or black motorists. That's right. it's simply not true. I mean, it occurs, but it's not the pattern that they're portraying. And and we didn't get a chance to get into it, but you, you said you described like three or four things of what this article said was happening. And I was going to rebut with, well, <laughs> isn't that exactly what, what they're doing with this article. Like, yes, they get into training and what they call alarmist training and academies and commanding officers rely on misleading statistics, gory cop killing videos and simulated worst case scenarios to instill hypervigilance, hypervigilance. Many officers are trained to place a hand on the trunk of the car as they approach to leave fingerprints as if, Evidence if ambushed by the driver. First of all, that is not why. No. <laughs> you do that to see if there's someone in the trunk, don't right. you? To see if someone okay. moves. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, it, it does serve twofold, a twofold purpose, but uh, at least your fingerprints will be on there somewhere. There is evidence of you being there, but I think the public has caught on to that by now. So with the, these words that they're using, misleading statistics, gory cop killing videos and then they get into the Kyle Dinkheller. I, I can understand where their fear is that um, the training that takes place is uh, showing nothing but videos where cops are slaughtered on traffic stops and making them worry. I, I can tell you that's, that's bogus. That's not exactly what law enforcement training is. I was part of a law enforcement training cadre um, and we do more scenario based training than, uh, you know, the federal government provides more scenario based training, uh, than the, 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 uh, uh, public would know or understand. And 
you know, please, by all means, contact your local law enforcement agency and see what training they're doing. But when you think about what they're saying, that they're just portraying images over and over to, to prime these officers into believing that traffic stops are deadly because you're going to have a bad encounter and you're not going to go home at the end of the night. Well, isn't that exactly what this article is doing to to people of color or to to the community as a whole that they're, they're kind of telling you, hey, be on notice because when you get pulled over for crossing over a yellow line, chances are you're going to be shot and killed, killed. by some rogue <laughs> officer who's just wanting to pull his gun out and, and murder people that night. And and that's right. not the case either. So uh, turnabout is fair play. And, and I, I, I disagree with their characterization that that's what law enforcement training is. If, if I had a nickel for every time somebody told me you all just need more training. In fact, if I had a nickel for every page of uh, training certificates, I'd, I'd probably be pretty wealthy anyway, but I mean, like it's binders full of certificates. It's, it's, it's on like the state mandates in Florida, the state mandates fair and impartial policing and bias based profiling training and all these other things. Like a lot of States do that. And, and, you know, on an annual basis. So it's not just, you know, you got to fire your gun and then we're going to teach you, uh, you know, uh, CPR. It, it's, it's so far beyond that. And it's so far advanced, even, even the equipment itself. So um, I think that's a very unfair characterization to say that we just pop in a VCR tape from 1986 and, and, and watch the, you know, the, the Marine veteran jump out of the car and, and shoot the officer on the traffic stop. Well, let me just touch on Kyle Jenkeller because it's uh, it's meaningful to me. I I interviewed the filmmaker Patrick Shaver, who made the documentary Officer Involved, which is about office the impact of a deadly force encounter on the officer. He then went on to make a film about Kyle Jenkeller. I had never heard of him, and uh, it was 1998. And it says in the article, seemingly every officer in America has watched the 1998 dash cam footage of Deputy Kyle Dinkeller's murder along the Georgia roadside. Well, you know what? He was shot and killed. And this is an example of what happens. And so was Ella French. Yes. You know, so and I just want to say Kyle Dinkeller was a young man. He was a person. He was more than one bad day. He was more than his incident. He has family. You know, so... I realize this, I'm taking this, uh, you know, I'm going a little off message here, but this reference to him in such a insensitive way, just like they don't name Ella, just, it, you know, I find it outraged, out, you know, enraging. Um, I think it's more on message than you think, because the, the assumption is that this is uh, being played over and over to fire up the masses, like showing a clip from the movie 300. Like it's like, we're going to show you Kyle Dinkeller's <laughs> death just so you'll know this is what's probably going to happen to you. So you better, you know, re but that's, that's not the case in the same breath. I'm telling you that that's not the only training aid we use. Right. I've seen the Kyle Dinkeller. I I've probably used it in some of my training, but there's, there are way more, uh, lessons within that traffic stop right. to teach, right. such as right. like, you right. know, look at this guy, he gets out of the car and he starts dancing and he claps his hands. And this is what happens when, you know, somebody is getting ready to, or somebody's having some kind of episode or somebody, th there are things that you can look out for. It doesn't necessarily mean that everyone's going to jump into the back end of the truck and pull out a rifle and start shooting. Right. Um, right. But there are, there are several lessons that can be learned from that. And unfortunately, um, you know, in these training videos, it's, it's morbid to think that the, the, the subject of the training video has been, you know, his yeah. life has been erased essentially right. by somebody who, who just because he was wearing a uniform decided to take him out. Right. Well, and also in Kyle's, I, I, I mean, I don't know, but how much he did not want to shoot this guy, Right. you know, it's, I it, mean, it, it, it is a complete it's, ex it's mentally exhausting. I mean, you're, you're trying to, even a suicidal person, you're trying so hard to, to not have to do what you're going to right. have to do. I mean, it's not what you're going to have to do, but 
you're just trying so hard to not get to that um, final decision. Like right. it's just, it, it, it's, it's mentally exhausting because there is adrenaline that is coursing through your body and you're thinking either I'm going to be killed or I'm going to have to kill someone or they're going to listen to what I'm trying to tell them and they're going to calm themselves down. Mm. Uh, because they're obviously not listening to what I'm saying. Well, and in the interview I did recently with Detective Britt Kelly from the Seattle Police Department, she was talking about that moment of trauma for the officer when the officer realizes that this is a life or death situation. If you've got your gun out, you've made the decision that you may have to use deadly force. And so what she says is, you know, you have deemed it necessary to either save your life, the life of another officer or a civilian. And that's the trauma. You, she, you are now in a position of a life or death situation. Yeah. You're, you're either saving your own life or, or the, the life of somebody else. That's, that's the rule of engagement. And, and it's, it goes beyond that even because it's death or great bodily harm in a lot of States. So if you're preventing death or great bodily harm to somebody, I mean, you know, poking an eye out or, or whatever. I mean, even edged weapons, like, you know, knives, right. people don't right. understand the, the closing distance of, of 21 feet or six feet. They think it's, you know, they, they think that it's a million miles away, but it's not. When somebody's running at you with a, with a, uh, with a knife out or, you know, ready to stab you, um, trying to pull your firearm out and, and, or, or you don't just, pull out a red cape like a Toria door and, <laughs> and let the bull run by you. It just, it doesn't work that way. Well, what I learned the 21 foot rule was, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, is that a suspect can charge at you from 21 feet away and inflict a fatal injury before you even have time to reach for your weapon. Yeah. So that, that's, yeah, that's exactly right. 21 feet is the, the closing distance. Um, and I don't know who made this determination. Right. <laughs> I, I, I know that it is court tested, but right. you're not going to have time for the average human to run at you with a, with a edge weapon. If they're within 21 feet to get your gun out to defend yourself or, or get some kind of, uh, weapon out to defend yourself. Right. Uh, I meant Matador, not for your door. Oh, <laughs> I didn't catch it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's see. So towards the end, the article talks about um, icons of the Black Lives Matter movement. It, it says, including Dante Wright, shot in uh, Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, after being pulled over for expired registration tags. So let me stop there. Dante Wright was perhaps pulled over for expired reg registration tags. Uh, that's not the way I understand it. The way I understand it is that he had a failure to appear warrant for possession of a pistol without a permit. So in the officer's mind already, they're going in thinking he has a gun, not to mention this was an accidental shooting in the sense that Kim Potter, the officer who shot him thought that she, oh, she had her taser out. She yelled taser and she shot and killed this guy. And she's serving a two year sentence for manslaughter. So I, I always hear about, well, you know, these incidents of racism or these incidents of bad policing or these incidents of murder. And every time they give me an incident of murder, I say, you mean Kim Potter, the one that was convicted by a jury of her peers and is serving two years for manslaughter? I mean, how are we not held accountable for that, number one? And number two, it's mischaracterized in the story as just – he was just being pulled over for a temp for a, for a tag violation, which is not true. Um, they, they go on to talk about Rayshard Brooks and their description of Rayshard Brooks. It says shot running from officers in a Wendy's parking lot in Atlanta. He now, had a taser. Yeah. If that's not oversimplifying it, I don't know what it is. Um, let's, let's back up just a little bit. This was just after George Floyd. He was a, he was asleep in the drive through line because he was, presumably intoxicated. The DUI investigator showed up, did their investigation, uh, and they were placing him under arrest, at which time he 
decided he did not want to go to jail and, and, and be held accountable for the DUI part of, of his uh, part of the incident, got a hold of one of the officer's tasers, fired it, was running away, turning in the direction of the other officer, getting ready to fire the taser again, and at which point he was shot uh, and, and, and tragically killed. I mean, we didn't want it to turn out that way, I'm sure. I didn't want it to turn out that way, but those are choices he made. So he was shot and killed, um, but this article just characterizes it as he was just in a Wendy's parking lot in Atlanta and he ran away from the cops. Well, and he ran because they were starting to, didn't he have a warrant? He was, uh, he, I don't know if he had a warrant or not. He was definitely were, being placed under arrest for, for right. DUI from what I remember. Yeah. So and then, at that point he stopped cooperating and that's when he ran. Yeah. Cause he was ultra. See, this is the other thing. This, this is, this is, it's funny that they use that case to characterize how horrible police are in traffic stops when they were respectful to Mr. Brooks, Mr. Brooks, we'll call him was respectful to the officers up to the point when those handcuffs came out. And at which time Richard Brooks made the decision to attack those two officers and got a taser from right. one of them. And the district attorney, the same district attorney that um, filed criminal charges on those two officers, Garrett Rolfe and, and, and his partner uh, is the same district attorney who said a few weeks prior that that same taser is a deadly weapon. So, he changed his tune to fit it to Mr. Brooks, to, to fit it to Rayshard Brooks. But again, the article itself, they're calling him a Black Lives, uh, an icon of the Black Lives Matter movement. And they, they characterize it as he was shot from officers in a Wendy's parking lot in Atlanta. People aren't going to remember that story. Right, exactly. They're going to remember the fact that this guy was running from <laughs> officers in a way. Right. The final, the final uh, icon they, they review or they talk about is, Jordan Edwards. Um, I, I don't know a whole lot about this case. Uh, he was a 15 year old passenger shot leaving a house party in Balk Springs, Texas. So what, what's not said here, um, it said, but relatives and many others question whether race played a role in their deaths. So they're, they're positing that they're right. putting that out into the atmosphere for people to ponder. Right. It's not whether it's it's only a question because they want to put it out there. It, it doesn't right. necessarily mean that, that it was a question at the time. Right. Because what happened with Jordan Edwards was police were called to a very loud house party, and there was a vehicle leaving. Shots were fired. The officer who who was who actually did the shooting of uh, of this young man, Jordan Edwards tragically shot and killed him because he fired into that car, but he thought that they were being fired upon from the same car. Well, again, this is the same. Uh, and by the way, it was rival gangs that started shooting at one another. The car, I guess was unrelated. They were trying actually to get out of there because they were scared themselves. So this is a horrible case. The officer, uh, who's the officer whose name is Roy Oliver, received a 15 year sentence for, for the murder. So again, if we're, we're talking about accountability or being held to account, um, two of the three, uh, hold on a second, three of the three, 100% of the cases in here, somebody was indicted for a police officer was indicted for. So when you think about the tone of the article that, Officers fire with impunity and they're rarely held uh, criminally responsible. The three articles that the, or the three incidents that they cite, somebody was indicted in all three of them. It's just that uh, the middle case, the Dante Wright case, somebody came and undid those arrests. Uh, in the other two cases, there were actually convictions and prison sentences involved. So I, I don't, I, I, I just, there is a disconnect between this article and reality. Um, mm -hmm. There's plenty of accountability. Um, th there are incidents of uh, citizens being violent with officers. There are incidents of officers being violent with citizens. It's been that way. It's, it's bound to get better, but this is not, this article 
is is not solving anything. It, it's it's creating more division. It's creating uh, it, it's it, it's making a garden snake look like a king cobra, and that's a dangerous precedent when you're an officer out there trying to protect the 99% of the law-abiding citizens that pay for that protection. I had noted what you're along the lines of what you're saying. And one of the reasons I wanted to go through this article and it isn't to be, you know, flip or um, cavalier. I'm not just trying to give the New York times a hard time. No. The, the, the danger is in how it affects societal perception. The danger is it affects officers' ability to do their jobs. And it influences states and municipalities to create policies and laws that further jeopardize the lives of police. And in turn, further jeopardize the lives of citizens because exactly. of police apprehension. Exactly. I went back and looked up. I wanted to, I wish that I had studied logic and debate in school because I there had to be a term for this article. And I looked up circular arguments, which circular argument often uses a claim as both a premise and a conclusion. Right. That's exactly what this article does. <laughs> it's exactly what it is. And, and it, it can posit its own theory and then rely on its own article to back its own theory that it posited. So, right. yeah, I, I mean, I get the, I, I definitely get that premise of the circular argument, and I, I agree that that's how this is characterized. Even well, I, I, half the hyperlinks in this article link back to their own previous stories. Right. And then there was one paper by a professor that they linked to three times, so they make it look like they've got all this data that they are they are referencing when it's all the same stuff all over again right you know so again going back to the cover the officers overreaction and seemingly avoidable deaths seemingly avoidable i mean yeah so so it's it's definitely not a citizen a bad citizen reaction to an officer's right. simple law, lawful Action. Right. Right. It's, I mean, it's the presumption that the officer is wrong. Right. Let's try compliance, folks. Yeah, let's try. Um, <laughs> um, so maybe as a cleansing exercise, <laughs> we could talk about, you know, and we'll wrap up here in a, with this. What is it like to make a traffic stop? I mean, I've done ride alongs and in the beginning, you know, every officer wants to make sure I get good footage because I'm filming, right? So they'll do a traffic stop and typically it's just a, they, someone gives someone a warning. But I remember being on a ride along and the sergeant asked me, do you want me to do a traffic stop so you can get some B-roll? And I'm like, oh my God, no. I said, I would never want to jeopardize your life for some footage. I'm not going to put your life at risk because I need B-roll. You know, so you as a, tell me what it's like to make a traffic stop. You, um, you know, you it's it, it, you shift into a different gear, um, and it's not necessarily the fast gear. You have to remember too. What's the point? Not what's the point. What's the purpose of the stop? So if you're conducting a traffic stop where a car speeds out of a, a convenience store at two in the morning. Um, and cuts over three lanes of traffic and their, their, uh, taillights are out. Um, the, the, uh, the hair on the back of your neck is probably going to stand up and, and, you know, you got two or three little cues that make you think, well, what did just happen here? I mean, is it somebody that's drunk? Is it somebody that forgot to turn their lights on? Is it somebody that needs to get home or did they just rob the convenience store? I mean, there's a thousand different scenarios and we're not training officers by showing them Kyle's video that we're, we're training them to take the totalities, take, 
take all the totality of circumstances and make your decisions and stick with your decisions and be bold and confident and gather all your information objectively and then, you know, safely make your stop. You got uh, things, things you have to take into consideration. Like, are, are you stopping under a street light? Are you put, are you on the right kind of road to make a traffic stop because you don't want to get um, waffled by a car whizzing by and, you know, there's about a thousand things that go through your mind. The the tint on the windows. How many people can you see with with the lights, uh, you know, flooding in the night, you know, into the car? Can you see shadows in the back seat? So, um, there there are if there aren't any bees or butterflies in your stomach when you're walking up to a traffic stop, particularly at night and you're alone, uh, it's probably time to to get out of the business. Um, because you're probably a little bit too complacent at that point. Uh, it's not to say that you should be heel to toe duck walking with your handgun out. And uh, that's not what I'm saying at all. I mean, you just, there is a full evaluation that you're making that is well beyond what's the color of this driver's skin. So I can make this mm-hmm. traffic stop. You've already called the tag in by that point. Hopefully you've called out your location so people can come find you if, if things go wrong or, or what, you know, if you just, people just want to come check on you or whatever, but it's, but the traffic stop itself, I mean, the, the, you know, it's cliche to say there is no such thing as a routine traffic stop, but it's the truth. I've it, traffic stops are snowflakes. Like there are no two traffic stops that are same. I mean, I think if you looked at them under the microscope, chemically, they'd have the same appearance, but everyone's going to be just a little bit different. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the, um, that's one of the issues with the traffic stop. You, You can't just walk up with your with your guard down at a one or a two, you're definitely going to walk up at least at a five. And then you know, move it up or move it down, depending on the driver or the passenger. Right. Right. I just can't imagine walking up to that window. It's, it's nerve wracking sometimes. And, and some of the most, you know, menacing looking people, <clears throat> this is a, t- this is a classic case of not judging a book by a cover because some of the most menacing people who are acting nervous or whatever, when they find out why you stop them, they're completely disarmed and, and, and you're disarmed and maybe not complacent, but, and then it works the opposite. Some of the people that you think, you know, like I've had a pastor cuss me out one time and you know what I mean? Like, it's <laughs> just, you, you just, you don't know what you're dealing with or you don't know what, the, what they've just gone through. It's, it's the same right. thing with the officer. Like you don't know what the officer has just gone through. So you don't know what their reaction is going to be. So right. um, it's a potentially volatile situation. You're not going to walk in at zero. You're going to walk in at maybe five and then take it up or take it down. Well, I just, I, you know, I, if they would do articles about what it's like, what it's really like, you know, and how most traffic stops go, it, it would be, it would be a different world. And I think, I don't think we're doing anyone a service by creating a premise and then pushing that premise as fact. I agree. I agree. And it, it's, it's creating the resentment that is feeding the beast. Right. Right. On both sides. Well, right. Objective. Right. Right. <laughs> well, thanks. Um, I'm, I, uh, I have to say, when I read that article, 2021, I, my heart just sank, you know, I just, I saw the headline and I just thought, oh my God. And so many departments since then have, not so many, but some departments have limited traffic stops and what an officer can stop for. And, you know, as I said, this, these have real life implications. So this is one of the largest papers in the United States. I mean, you know, there's plenty of sets of eyeballs that that read this article and it was at a very volatile time in the country so i mean they had the ability to persuade the country for the good or tell a, a series of you know quarter truths or half truths and and persuade the country for the bad this this article is not about uniting anybody or or putting out a perception of what actually happens in a traffic stop this is about 
perpetuating a narrative that they think is what happens in a traffic stop. And, you know, they use terms like their investigation is uncovered, but their investigation is generally trumped by a court of law where people actually have to raise their right hand and testify. So, um, you know, this was an opportunity, maybe this article to to tell two sides of a story, but it, it didn't. It told one side of the story. And and again, I, I do think that this is the, uh, you know, turn in the garden snake into the cobra. Right. right. Well, you know, thanks for walking through it with me. I think everybody listening to you or me would feel the same way, but it would be helpful if people would have a more discerning you know, approach when they read words that really like it goes back to uh, your article that you wrote where it said um, police shoot teen. Like the headline is the police shoot teen. But what they don't write is police shoot teen engaged in police engaged in a gun battle with a shoot teen. Right. I don't remember. You said it far more eloquently, but it, you know, you leave out those details. It's just like you were saying about those situations um, in the article. You leave out the key information. Right. And the, so the key information that could, that can sway a, a key demographic. Like I, I'm, I am sure there's a, 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 a plenty of citizens in this country that would just like to hear the truth instead of yeah. being told what they should believe as the truth. Right. Well, on that, I will thank you for your time thank and for you. being thank here. For the opportunity. And, uh, you know, thanks for walking through this with me. I've, it's been bothering me for over a year. It's been bothering <laughs> but, me for 28. <laughs> <laughs> well, good to see you. Thanks again.